Good afternoon to all of you. I'm really excited to be here today because I get to talk to you about my favorite subject. I've been fascinated with airplanes since I was a little child. I started flying at 15 years old, and my entire professional life has either been flying airplanes or working on the systems on board the airplanes and connecting them with applications in the airspace. As much as I love this business, I have to acknowledge that despite all of our technology, all the work that's been done, it's not as good as it can be. I want to talk to you today about a technology that will make the system more predictable. The experience you have as a passenger as you get on an airplane, you'll arrive and depart more predictably on time. We'll burn a lot less fuel, create a lot less noise, less emissions. The challenge is that it's going to require a change in our thinking, our concept of operation, the philosophy that we have currently in use. The system that we have today was built up over many decades, and principally it's a ground-based or ground-centric system. And the reason it was built that way was limitations in the airplane capabilities at the time that that was being built. The, the work that we're going to do is to make the airplane more of a center of the operation. And the best way that I can describe the concepts here is to use an analogy. I want to talk to you about our ground transportation system and help communicate some of the concepts to you. Something that we see quite a bit, many of us experience traffic jams. What's unusual in this picture is a control tower. Imagine if there was a human controller in a tower in cities that was responsible for the safe separation of all the vehicles in that picture. Every movement that a car or truck made was directed by this human controller using a radio transmission. Now, a couple things would happen. First of all, there'd be a lot of workload for the controller, there'd be a lot of radio traffic, but there'd be a lot less cars in that picture. We'd have to reduce the number of vehicles and increase the spacing because of the limitations of the human controller and the bandwidth of the control system. What we had the opportunity to do is to move towards our uh, next picture, state highway system. Now, we don't have control towers in this either, distributed around the countryside. Instead, the interstate highway system, as it was built, launched by the Eisenhower administration in the 50s, recognized that vehicles have the ability to position themselves and to guide themselves. And so the structure of that highway is such that the cars follow these lanes delineated with paint stripes and reflective markers. We see a lot of efficiency of transport, a lot of capacity, in fact, we understand that the interstate highway system has been fundamental in the growth of the economy of our country as it's connected cities and increased the flow of goods between these communities. To uh, look a little bit more back at our aviation system, let me take you to a place that gets a lot of attention, the New York area. The airport's there. There's four of them here in this picture, Newark, JFK, LaGuardia, and Teterboro, which is primarily a business airport. These airports are all closely spaced. All the airplanes that fly in and out of those airports are directed by a human controller, radioing directions to each of those vehicles. And if we look at a time history of how those airplanes flow in and out, we see a lot of just kind of chaotic movement, high variance, inefficient type operation. Imagine if we replace all of that with the equivalent of the interstate highway system this very neatly organized, we could call them highways in the sky, bringing airplanes in and out of these airports. We'd see a lot of capacity improvements. We'd see a lot more efficient operations. To understand how we got there, let's go back and look in time at how, aviations have, uh, how airplanes have developed and our systems around them. The earliest commercial use of airplanes in this country was primarily moving mail. We had airmail pilots flying for the U.S. Commerce Department, flying in fairly primitive airplanes. The navigation means was all visual. The pilots looking outside the airplane, spotting sights on the ground and navigating that way. And at night, to aid that navigation, the Commerce Department built bonfires. 
that the pilots would fly to and then move to the next bonfire. Quickly, that was replaced with lighted beacons. As aviation continued to grow, airplanes became more sophisticated. There was a need to fly not just in the day and night conditions, but also in all weather conditions when you couldn't see outside. And as congestion increased, there was a need to separate the airplanes from each other so we wouldn't have collisions. The pilots couldn't see each other. So as the lighted beacons on the ground tra transitioned to radio beacons for this all-weather navigation capability, there was also the introduction of World War II technology, radars, that was put in place in various places on, around the ground and the controllers use radar to determine the position of the airplane and then provide directions to ensure that we had safe separation. As aviation continued to develop, of course, we had jet airplanes, faster speeds, more complex operations. The ground radars were supplemented with secondary surveillance radar, which provided a lot more precise information, more information about each of the vehicles. If we look at a current cockpit today in our modern airplane, we see something entirely different than what we would have seen in that earliest airplane. And there's principally four significant capabilities that we didn't have back then. We have the ability with global navigation satellite systems, GPS now, to precisely position our airplanes. The airplanes can determine their own position independent of anything on the ground within just a few feet anywhere on the globe. We have computers that can construct these virtual highways in the sky, build these trajectories, these flight paths for the airplanes to follow. Electronic displays that give the pilots a perspective of where the center line of the highway is and whether they're left or right, up or down, and even in time, forward or behind. And then finally, we have very sophisticated flight guidance systems that relieve the pilot of the manual task of following those highways and make the operation very dependable, very predictable. So we have all this technology we didn't have in the 1950s. Let's use it. And so this is where the, the story takes a little bit of a personal turn. This is a little bit of my story. This is a picture of Juneau, Alaska. The time is the early 1990s. I'm a young pilot there flying 727s, 737s. And the operations there are quite limited. A lot of the of the flights we, the maneuvers we conducted were similar to the airmail pilots in the old uh, airmail days with the biplanes. If we were taking off to the east, which is the direction we're looking at in this picture, if the weather, the ceiling was lower than 5,000 feet, we couldn't continue flying straight ahead. The navigation accuracy of our systems wasn't sufficient to fly straight ahead. So we'd have to do a visual maneuver and turn around and fly back over open water, which is behind us in this picture. So let me talk you through a, a, a typical departure. We call this the Lemon Creek departure. So as the airplane is going down the runway and just as it lifts off, we have to bank the airplane 30 degrees of bank, hard left turn, 60 degrees off of heading, followed by another hard roll to the right, 30 degrees of bank, power coming back, leveling off at 800 feet above the ground, keeping the speed to a minimum so the turn radius is a minimum to stay inside of that terrain. And all the while in this turn, we're using visual landmarks in that area up in the upper left picture, things like a trailer park, the Fred Meyer grocery store. This is a jet with 170 people on board. The, the Alaskans were fairly used to the operation, but when folks from the lower 48, or the outside as they call us, would come in, they'd be a little bit more concerned. It was a safe operation, but there wasn't a lot of room for error. There wasn't a lot of margin. It took a lot of skill, a lot of training to be able to do that properly. And if the weather went down, which it does frequently in Juneau, Alaska, we couldn't do this maneuver. Juneau is a city that, it's the state capital of Alaska, but it's only accessible by airplane or by boat. Most people take the airplanes. So when the clouds would lower, that city would be isolated, sometimes for many days. So this is the confluence of events that I experienced in the early 90s. The technology was there, the difficulties of this particular operation, my own personal experience and background. And I began to engineer a way where we could develop a highway, use this equipment to create this virtual highway where we could fly the airplanes 
In this case, I'll show you the example in departure, but not just out, but also in. So instead of making this wild maneuver in visual conditions, we fly just a normal straight ahead departure. The power's at climb power, small turn to the right, flying straight ahead down this narrow channel of water that was too narrow for us to use in previous, with the previous technology. Now this all got a lot of attention as the, eight, as the 90s continued. And by 2003, myself and two partners created this company called Navris, and we began to work around the world. There's a lot of interest in taking what we had done in Alaska and dealing with similar problems. I want to take you some of these, just continue to, to uh, explain and demonstrate this virtual highway in the sky concept. This is Kelowna, uh, Canada. It's in British Columbia, just north of Spokane, Washington. It's up in the Okanagan Valley. And the operations there were much like Juno. You've got mountains, difficult weather, limited ground beacons for navigation. And if we look at a time history of flights in and out of there, we see similar types of things we see in New York. A lot of variation with pilots having to do some navigation of their own. That's been replaced by these virtual highways. That previous picture was 114 flights. This is 116 flights, the recorded track history, but it looks like just a single line. This is that concept of the interstate highway system and that virtual path that these airplanes can follow very precisely. Moving to another location in New Zealand. This is Queenstown, New Zealand. It's the south end of the South Island, a beautiful recreation area, a lot of interest in going there for skiing and boating activities. Difficult environment. Again, the virtual highways come in and it's a completely different, much better organized operation. And I'll show you here just a little bit of uh, the engineering aspects. Different than our surface highways, because airplanes can descend and climb, there's a three-dimensional aspect to the engineering. So there's both the left and right, but there's also the up and down. In western China, a uh, very difficult environment in Tibet, it's the Tibetan Plateau. This is Lhasa, it's 11,700 feet. We began work there in 2004. The mountains go several thousand feet above the airport. The virtual highway comes in and now the pilots have very precise guidance down through the mountain valleys, bringing the airplane safely to a landing at the airport. So all of this is quite interesting, but let me move you to another phase. Not just the mountainous phase, but something beyond. Many of you maybe have been to Cusco. Cusco is a mountainous airport. Uh, if you've been to Machu Picchu, this would be the airport you'd fly into as a tourist, and then you'd take surface transport to Machu Picchu. The before picture looks very similar to what we've seen already. Replaced by the virtual highways, a much more organized flow, bringing airplanes in from different directions to the, to the runway. But what's different in Peru is it's not just the mountainous air, like, airport story, it's Lima, over on the coast, flat country, there's no mountains, there's a lot of traffic. The original route between these two cities was fairly inefficient. It's using the ground beacons as they could be placed around the different places in the country. That was replaced and the first operation went in in February of 2012, just a few months ago. And the result is that the airplane now has a virtual highway as you come off the runway in Cusco. It connects with this route that takes the airplane directly to Lima and then guides the airplane to a landing and touchdown at Lima. Now on a per flight basis, there's quite a bit of savings. There's 19 less miles that are being flown. That amounts to a lot of uh, reduction in flying time, fuel being burned and so forth. But on an annual basis, it really adds up. Cusco is a very popular tourist destination and the traffic density is quite high. And so these savings on a per flight basis can get to be quite large on an annual basis. So this is interesting looking at this around the world, but what about us here in the United States? Imagine if, and it takes some imagining because the system we have today is, it's been built up over several decades. There's a lot of infrastructure. It's gonna take some time to change it, but imagine if we could flip the switch. Tomorrow we could go to this highway in the sky system to all of our airports in the United States. If we're able to do that, the savings are quite significant. Fuel reduction would be substantial. Emissions of the fuel that's being burned would be, of course, eliminated. 
There's an economic cost to all of that fuel that's being burned. But there's something here else that I want to bring to your attention. It's the time reduction. Many of us spend time on an airplane strapped into the airplane seat as we're taxiing around on the ground and waiting for our turn to land in the air. We all have a finite amount of life on this earth. And the time that we're on an airplane is usually, it's important, we're going someplace. It could be a wedding, it could be a funeral, it could be an important job interview, it could be a, an important business meeting. Maybe it's a businessman just wanting to get home to see their kids play, school play. There's a social cost to our system that we have today. So what does this mean for you, for us here in Cincinnati? If you look into how airplanes operate in and out of the Cincinnati airport, you look at the time history of flights in and out of the airport, you'll see something that looks really familiar that we've seen in some of these other places around the world that I've shown you. With technology today, you have the ability to look into this world that previously was fairly opaque. It was left to the experts. You can go on the web today and you can see this picture. You can buy an app for your iPhone or your iPad or whatever and watch this. And so the challenge I have for you is to get involved, ask questions. If you're on an airplane and you see the airport go by and 20 minutes later you land and you ask yourself, why did we fly by the airport and it took us 20 minutes to come back to it? You look at pictures like this. You, sometimes you see airplanes that take off from another country and they're flying into uh, Cincinnati maybe. And just before they land, they start flying in circles. They've been flying eight hours. Did we just find out that they're here, that they're gonna be here? The system is not using time. It's not a predictable system. Aviation is a public utility, and how this infrastructure is built out is everybody's business. And so again, I challenge you to ask the questions and get involved, because it's that exterior or external scrutiny that will help our industry change. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm looking forward to, in my lifetime, continuing on these concepts, and I know we can bring it home. Thank you.